Hello, sunshine. This is Alexi Lawless, and welcome to the State of the Union podcast, where we look at the beautiful game on and off the field through the lens of red, white, and blue colored glasses. This week, we'll be talking oh, the Super Bowl, obviously, U.S. Hall of Fame, Mad Max, CBA, CCL, Klops, Laton, Tigris, Arliss. Where are they now? U.S. Men's National Team edition, the professor, the madman, and so much more. But first, joining me, as always, my friend, my colleague, my guiding light, David Mossy, a soccer savant and a Fox soccer researcher and writer extraordinaire. Mossy, how are you on this Monday, February 8th? in the year 2021, the day after the Super Bowl. I am doing well. Alexi, I don't know if you remember this, but uh, the very first episode of the State of the Union podcast occurred in, I believe, February of 2018. It was the Monday after the Eagles-Patriots Super Bowl. Uh, the very first conversation we had on this podcast was about the Super Bowl. So although this is a soccer podcast, Super Bowls do serve as sort of an anniversary of sorts for this podcast. So I, I did think about that in the last couple of days. So does that mean this is in essence, our three-year anniversary, kind of? I believe so, yeah. Oh, well, happy anniversary, buddy. It's been a pleasure uh, and a <laughs> privilege to be able to do this with you uh, on a weekly basis. You know, we've, we've, we've taken some twists and turns uh, there, but that's a, that's a good way to kind of frame it and a good uh, marker, if you will, is that, uh, is that Super Bowl. Um, did you watch the Super Bowl? I mean, uh, you know, I, I, oh, hold on. Before you get to that, uh, a whole week happened before the Super Bowl. I want to finish with the Super Bowl. I want to start just because, it, uh, you know, we talk about stuff that we watched here. And uh, I, I saw a couple of things that I really want to mention um, before we uh, before we hit, dive into the Super Bowl. Um, I, as, as many people have done in this pandemic, you've kind of gone back and revisited stuff. I've gone back and revisited the, uh, the Mad Max uh, the first two, I haven't uh, gone to Thunderdome yet. And I'm not talking about the, the latest one that happened. I'm talking about the original three, I guess it would be. And I do include Thunderdome in that original three. The first one is just a wild, wild, weird type of viewing experience um, uh, with Mel Gibson. And then the second one, more iconic and really the one that every, everybody kind of points to, still is incredibly disturbing and violent, as, as they all are. Um, but I, I went back and rewatched those. And then I also watched this, uh, this interesting movie called The Professor and the Madman uh, that stars Mel Gibson and Sean Penn. This strange, I didn't even think it was a real true story until I looked it up, but this strange mix of these two, uh, these two men that actually helped to create the first edition of the, the British version of um, the dictionary, the English language dictionary. So I do recommend all three of those things that uh, that I just mentioned. Anything that you watched this week that you want to mention before we hit the Super Bowl? Well, first off, if I seem distracted during this podcast taping, I'm actually watching television right now. Uh, we're taping this on a Monday morning. I have the Bayern Munich Al Ali Club World Cup semifinal match on. Alfonso Davies and company uh, taking on Egyptian opposition. So I'll keep you posted on any developments okay. there. All right. well, we're we'll talk, talk about the Club World Cup later. Um, as far as uh, other types of television. I can't get off this Francophile tip I'm on. After finishing Lupin, call my agent. I then discovered this other French show on Netflix called Family Business, which is a comedy. It's absolutely hilarious. I love that I plowed through both seasons very quickly. And now I've started watching The Bureau, uh, which is an Amazon Prime show, a drama about uh, French uh, espionage. It's kind of the French equivalent of the CIA. It's kind of the French homeland, it's been called. So I'm um, only a couple of episodes in, but uh, so far, so good. Oh, my God. It, it's, you know, look, we know that you got your your snobbery uh, when it comes to your viewing habits, but you might have hit an all-time low <laughs> or high, depending on. Uh, it, it's one thing to be watching, you know, French uh, subtitled or dubbed type of stuff, but French comedy, boy, that uh, is nothing <laughs> better than French comedy, as far as I'm concerned, Mossy. Well done. Uh, I'm really going to check that out. Uh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Enough of that. Um, all right, Super Bowl. The, you know, did you watch it? Uh, and what were your what were your initial thoughts of the? Uh, and it's not even the game. People ask you, well, what would you think of the Super Bowl? And and it inevitably comes to uh, mostly other stuff. Uh, congratulations to uh, the Tampa Bay Buccaneers on being Super Bowl champions, and you know, one of the greats of all time. Um, when it comes to uh, to Tom Brady, we're going to talk more about goat type of status later on in the uh, in the podcast but it, it 
I mean, it's going to lack something just because of the circumstances and what's going on in our, in our world. There, there were fans, not necessarily a full stadium, but it was a little muted. And I think that's to be expected, right? It was, yeah. The game was a disappointment. Um, it just was essentially four quarters of genuflecting about Tom Brady's greatness. Um, the I did watch with a couple of buddies, uh, social distancing, of course, and the uh, halftime show did spawn an interesting conversation, which we Googled all the previous halftime shows in Super Bowl history and tried to figure out what's the greatest act at or near their prime in Super Bowl halftime history. We concluded that it was Michael Jackson in 1993. Uh, any other musician that there's been that's been sort of a comparable stature to Michael Jackson was somebody that was doing it in a later phase of their career. You had McCartney, the Stones, Prince, U2, et cetera. But Michael Jackson, 1993, that is like pretty close to his prime still. And so for an act of that stature to perform, I think that's probably the, the ultimate. And, and also I think it shows his breadth and, and his, his reach and how, you know, how impactful he was even at his, at his peak, because you recognize that a Super Bowl wants to attract as many people as possible. And often that is reflective in the uh, performers that they, uh, that they have. So you mentioned, you know, someone like, you know, I went to a Super Bowl once and the who performed and you know, I mean, this, this Super Bowl was, was the weekend. And even I know who the weekend is, even though I don't necessarily listen to it. So there's a, a general understanding and a, a uh, um, you know, a, uh, a notoriety, if, uh, if you will. But to your point, Michael Jackson at his peak, everybody knew who Michael Jackson was and everybody, whether they admitted it or not, uh, listened and liked uh, Michael Jackson. To your point, I still think the best performance was Prince, but, but to your point, it was later. He almost reemerged and confirmed what we all suspected. Uh, and after that performance, there was no doubt that he is arguably the greatest performer ever. Um, and what, and what he did. So I still look at something like, uh, like what Prince did as the, the pinnacle, but you're, yeah, you're right. You're right. It was okay. I mean, the, the, the halftime performance was, was fine. And I like the fact that he sang and he didn't lip sync. That was, that's important to me. And, and I love the fact, uh, uh, that he did it. Um, you know, the, the, the game was what it was. Um, I came out of it you know, the, the commercials are always a big thing. And I, I remember asking my, uh, my kids as the commercials came and we were, we were saying, you know, this one was good. This wasn't w w good. The one with the uh, Paralympic swimmer uh, I thought was incredibly well done. And one of those that kind of got to you, but I don't know if it's a problem, but I, I made a point of a couple minutes later after we had all agreed that that was a great commercial um, about this, this uh, young um a swimmer who was born in Siberia and then adopted by American parents. And, and it's just an amazing story in a, in a, a minute long or, or 90 second long type of uh, snippet and incredibly emotional. But I made, I made a point of asking my kids uh, and the people uh, and, and my wife, you know, who was here, I said, what was the advertisement for? And it was amazing how, while it resonated uh, from a dramatic standpoint and an emotional standpoint, very few people remembered that it was Toyota. Now that that could be Toyota was probably thinking bigger term and, uh, and longer term type of stuff, but it is interesting how much money is spent on these things ultimately to sell products, either in the now or in the future to create brand or awareness. And if it if you can't remember who is actually advertising, um, that could be a problem. I don't know. I don't know. Anything stand out to you in terms of the production? The commercials, you mean? Yeah, commercials or, or even, you know, the, the broadcast. Uh, well, I mean, you know, Tony Romo is, uh, I'm, yeah, I'm sure you're, you're aware of him. He's uh, sort of become a very... Yes, uh, I know who Tony Romo is. Yeah, very popular figure. Although there's, there's a little bit of a backlash. There are some people that don't think he's quite deserving of all the, the Money? plays that he gets. I mean, do you find him to be just an immensely entertaining color commentator in these games? And do you, do you learn a lot from listening to him? Um, not, not, not necessarily. I mean, I think he's, I do think he's entertaining. I love the fact that he sounds like he is enjoying what he's doing and he brings a passion and enthusiasm. I mean, I always say if, if the person I'm watching, whether I'm watching somebody or somebody's watching me, I always remind myself, if I can't be bothered to be excited about what I'm doing, then why should the viewer, 
And I, I do think that his, like I said, his passion, his exuberance, his energy is good. The, the, you know, the content of what he's talking about, and I know he's, he's now famous for kind of predicting different things. Um, and that's, that's cool. I, I enjoy that type of stuff, but I, I honestly, I'm much more interested in the words that he, cho- that he chooses, the way that he uses uh, those words to describe things and the entertainment value of it. And I, so I find him, I find him interesting. Um, and I find him, I find him good. I don't, I don't turn off when I, when I hear him. And I think he does now bring a, um, a level of, of credibility and interest, most importantly, when it comes to the, the things that he's doing. You? And actually, uh, Sunday was a big uh, landmark day for female officials because the Club World Cup match I did earlier in the day, uh, I was the first ever uh, female referee to officiate a, a senior FIFA men's match. And then we also had a female uh, referee as part of the officiating crew for the Super Bowl. So that was nice to see, too. Huh? Pretty landmark day in that regard. It was great. It was great. And, you know, we we celebrate and I think rightfully spotlight and focus and champion and and put you know, and, you know, make it newsworthy so that we get to a point where it's just commonplace and it's not newsworthy and it's just part of uh, everything, uh, everything that we do, but we're not there yet. So, uh, okay. Mossy, you ready to light this candle? Yep. All right. Let's move on and talk a little soccer, a lot of soccer, because there was all sorts of stuff uh, that was going on. Uh, We're going to start off with the hall of fame, the U S soccer hall of fame. Uh, yours truly is uh, privileged enough to be able to vote for uh, potential inductees as uh, a current member of the uh, of the hall. Uh, it's important to note, though, that over the last year, the powers that be, and look, there's there's a, there's basically a couple of full time employees when it comes to the U.S. men's not men's excuse me U.S. Uh, soccer Hall of Fame. It's based in Dallas, out of Frisco, Texas. It's actually a part of the FC Dallas uh, stadium that they have down there. And it's a great, great uh, facility. They've done a really, really good job. If you get a chance to go and you're into soccer, even if you're not into soccer, I think you find it really in- interesting. It's interactive uh, and it's you know very innovative. For a long time, the, the Hall of Fame was in mothballs. Anyway, uh, over the last year, they recognized that the voting process, um, they was out of whack. They believed it was out of whack and they wanted to do some different things. Uh, and so they've created committees, uh, they have created nomination type of committees, and uh, they've really worked very, very hard to try to make it um, as, I guess, for lack of a better word, fair. But, but ultimately, it's a popularity contest. We all know it's subjective, but they've tried to make it as fair as possible for something that is subjective. Uh, they've tried to make it as transparent as possible um, uh, and they've tried to uh, increase and include and bring in as many different voices as possible. And I think they've done a really, really good job. Is it where it needs to be? Uh, no, and, but it's heading in that direction. And so hats off to uh, all the folks over at the, uh, the Soccer Hall of Fame who have uh, pushed this in the right direction to make it better. Uh, that's, that's important. Uh, okay, so the... Uh, you know, the, the voting comes out, they send me basically an email with uh, the list. I was on, uh, I've been on calls before, before this, but ultimately you get sent this list. Nobody's told who they have to vote for. You are given uh, as much information as possible. It's up to you whether you want to access that. Um, I think it's kind of your responsibility if you're voting to, to know who these people are and If you don't know, to try to at least educate yourself so you have a better perspective. That doesn't necessarily mean that you should vote for him or her. Because part of the process, at least the way I go through it, is the impact that that person has made on on soccer. So anyway, uh, I am in the past, I used to be able to vote on the player finalists, also the veteran finalists and the builder finalists. In this case now, the way that it is being rearranged, I am only allowed to vote for the uh, the player finalists. And there's different groups that vote for other things. Not that I couldn't vote for the veterans. I mean, look at the, you look at the veterans. I played with them or against them or have known them all. And the, even the builder's ballot, 
you know, I mean, Tim Laiwiki and Joe Cummings and Clive Charles and Kevin Payne, all these guys that, that, uh, that I certainly have had uh, plenty of experience with, but that's neither here nor there. So I had to vote for my people. You're allowed to vote for 10. You don't have to vote for 10. Uh, and uh, I'm not going to tell you the 10 that I voted for, but I did make it very public that I thought that Hope Solo, who uh, is up and didn't get in, in the last year, I guess it was, is uh, someone that I want on my team and someone that I want in the U.S. Soccer Hall of Fame for what she has accomplished on the field, for the impact that she has made uh, through those accomplishments on the field that uh, has led to what I believe is um, the benefit and the improvement of the game and not just the women's game, but the game of soccer. And I think that she is as deserving as anyone. Does she come with baggage? Yes. But I would venture to say that whether you know it or not, there are plenty of people that are in this, the Hall of Fame uh, that come with, uh, come with baggage. Um, I know there are other Hall of Fames that have morals clauses and, and those types of things. Uh, this is not a Hall of Fame that at this point has that. Um, and I don't see that changing necessarily in the, uh, in the future. But there was, and, and has been over the years, a lot of controversy and talk about whether Hope Solo deserves. I think the general consensus right now and the overwhelming consensus is regardless of what you may think of her and her actions or who she is as a person, uh, that everybody's come to the point that you're looking at Certainly, in my estimation, the best American goalkeeper to ever play the game, men, men, uh, man or woman, and as far as I'm concerned, uh, arguably the best American soccer player ever to play the game. And I say arguably because there's plenty of other uh, uh, players out there that could possibly be part of the conversation. Masi, have you been following this Hall of Fame drama, I guess uh, we'd call it? Yeah, it, it certainly causes a lot of fear on Twitter. And I read a quote from the Hall of Fame director in explaining why they changed the voting process and created the screening committee and voting committee and tried to make it more transparent. He said that there's been too much focus the last few years on who didn't make it rather than who made it. And as you mentioned, the ultimate example of that the last couple of years was Hope Solo and also Steve Cherundolo. Those were two names that people couldn't believe didn't get in. And so, yeah, with the voting process having been amended, I mean, do you think it's now a certainty that Hope Solo will get in? It'd be hard to believe, right, that she wouldn't get in? Yeah, I think she's going to get in without a doubt. And and there's always the question as to, uh, or, or the the distinction that's important, that this is a U.S. Soccer Hall of Fame. This isn't a MLS Hall of Fame. This isn't an NWSL uh, Hall of Fame or any other group, USL or uh, any other league that you have out there. Now, those leagues may at some point decide that they want to take it in-house and make their own Hall of Fame. And that's going to be a problem for the U.S. Soccer Hall of Fame. And so I think they're, they're rightfully, because this is still a, I know it's a nonprofit, but it still has a, a, a business responsibility and needs to make itself as attractive as, as possible. And so the, the recognition for what players do from a, uh, a league standpoint has to factor in because uh, you want to like I said, the other leagues are going to do it at some point if you don't do it and if you don't recognize and if you don't give the, the, the love to some of these players that maybe from a national team perspective didn't have the, uh, the resume, but from an MLS perspective or an NWSL or whatever previous version uh, that you want to throw in there did wonderful things and ultimately did wonderful things for U.S. soccer. But you got to be able to put all of those different things. And to your point about the the talk and the controversy that's a good thing okay they won't they won't say it but when it comes to a hall of fame you do want people talking about who didn't get in that's that's part of this this is a this is a club okay and there's people that get in and people that don't and people are going to argue about the people that that don't that don't get in that's that's an okay thing i think what the what the uh, what the hall of fame was concerned about is that all of the talk was about who didn't get in and none of the talk was who, who ultimately did, uh, who did get into the hall of fame. And they're, they're trying to rectify that, but I don't want, and I don't think that they want to completely have a situation where nobody cares because it's so obvious and nobody is arguing these things. Well, looking at the player ballot, uh, I see David Beckham and Thierry Henry. Now Beckham is a case apart, obviously, but Thierry Henry is interesting. 
Um, how do you measure uh, the impact of these big name players that have come to MLS in the last few years, spent a few seasons here, certainly helped elevate the quality of the league, but is Thierry Henry an important enough figure in American soccer history to merit inclusion in the U S soccer hall of fame? No, I, I agree. Mean, I, I mean, it's a, six a little a lot different. Of headlines about these nominees included him, but I, I, I it frankly surprised me. Well, that's because he's a, you know, it's a, it's a big name. I mean, look, David Beckham, uh, I think is a, is separate, very separate than a Thierry Henry for, for the way he fundamentally changed the league. Uh, you know, you don't look at the Red Bulls any differently because of Thierry Henry, but you look at the Galaxy very differently pre David Beckham and post David Beckham. I mean, so he fundamentally changed the league as a whole, the team that he played for. Now, there's an argument that David Beckham ultimately could could get in much more so from a, uh, you know, a, a a builder type of standpoint because we know he's gone on and, is, and owns a team and has still stayed active in American soccer and obviously through major league, uh, major league soccer. But you know, these are these are the questions you have to you know you have to answer and to, to yourself. And we're only you're only ultimately beholden to what you feel is right and your criteria. Um, there are criteria. F- in order to get on the ballot. But then ultimately it's your own personal criteria as to who you pick, whether you pick 10 or not. I know people that refuse to pick 10. I know other people that are adamant about if I have 10, I am going to use 10. And there's other people that are much more picky and say, no, uh, the, the threshold that I have, and only they can tell you what that threshold is, they say, nope. Uh, just to your point about Steve Chirundolo, you know, the interesting thing about Steve Chirundolo is look, a wonderful international, uh, a wonderful servant to uh, the country in terms of his national team service. I think where people start to think about it is, and and this isn't this isn't a slight necessarily against Steve Trundle. We all make our different choices. You know, he chose to go a very different path and one that was very very successful, and in a maybe in an indirect way certainly helped. U.S. soccer with his success as a player, and he's continued on to help uh, in terms of the image of American players. I think where some people look at it differently is that, okay, that's all been about Germany. And so he, without a doubt, has helped German soccer in Bundesliga. And as I said, directly or indirectly, depending on the way you look at it, certainly has elevated the status of American players. But I, I think that that ultimately when you are deciding this, you have to look and you say, has this player impacted the sport of soccer in the United States? Has Have they helped it grow? And look, it, the, the answer might be yes to multiple people. So then you have to say, all right, but how much have they helped it grow relative to somebody else? And then you start measuring that, uh, that type of stuff. Uh, once again, this is not necessarily about the best players. Okay. Uh, this is about, oftentimes the impact that they that those players made and how they helped this is also about timing you know if in a, if i was up for the the hall of fame today it might be different um i might i might it might be harder for me if i had grown up and lived in the soccer world of today to get into the hall of fame than the time that i did and the time that i came to be and that's okay. Timing is also also part of life. Um, and and to your point, Mossy, about understanding who is on this list. When we talk about you know uh, people like Josh McKinney, uh, you know that uh, that are on this list from a Paralympic standpoint, uh, there will continue to be more and more people that are involved uh, that are put on this list that are quote unquote worthy. Okay. But in the past, they might not have been recognized. And so that's a good thing. It's a good thing that we are having, you know, these types of discussions and we are looking really closely at you know, who is getting on these uh, on these ballots. And is it representative of U.S. soccer? Is it is it 
is it what we want the Hall of Fame to be? And that, that has changed over the years. The, the definition of what the Hall of Fame is and what we want it to be has changed. Like anything, it evolves, it morphs, it, 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 it changes. Um, anyway, uh, so we've all done our, our votes and they will spew out who the next class is very soon. We will know uh, all, about, uh, all about that. And I do think that there will still be some, uh, you know, some some irritation and therefore some, uh, some back and forth and some debate as to who did get in and who didn't get in. And more importantly, why he or she didn't get in. Mossy, anything else? Uh, one name I see on the player ballot is uh, Allie Wagner. Uh, listen, I'm biased. She's one of my favorite human beings, but uh, I wonder if the broadcasting part of it factors in at all. I mean, she had a, certainly a very good playing career, but uh, she's also been immensely impactful in terms of knocking down barriers for women in, in her broadcasting career and, and calling men's World Cup games. And so, uh, yeah, I mean, it's the, I'm, like I said, I'm biased, but if I had a vote, I, I would probably <laughs> select Allie. Yeah, I mean, I don't, I think that I think that when people look at Allie uh, right now, I think they're looking at her predominantly as a player. Um, you're, the impact that she has had, you you and I understand it, and I think there's a, a proximity effect that's that, that's going on. So we understand it. I think I think her impact will be felt and will become come to be appreciated more as we get as we get further along. Uh, unfortunately. And you know all of that, all of that weighs in. And there's there's people that will look at it and say that has nothing to do with my vote. That has nothing to do with how I am assessing the uh, the player, and are just specifically looking at it. And that's why I say this is this, there is no formula. There's no plug in the numbers and spit it out. If there was, we would be done with it, and there wouldn't be any type of argument uh, or debate when it come uh, when when it comes to this. So it. It is an honor any way you slice it. I am incredibly honored to be part of this very privileged and small and elite type of group. Um, but I also recognize that when you start throwing out the word deserve, I mean, who's to say that I or, or anybody else deserve to be in more than somebody else just because nobody was following that particular version of the sport or the women's game wasn't even close to uh, gaining the attention that the men's game was at the time or you know all of these different things that have have played uh, have played into it so while while I appreciate it and I respect it and um, and and I am honored by the fact that I am in I, I take it with a grain of salt okay and it's maybe it's easy because I'm in to be able to do that but I, I do recognize that at the end, it's just a, another club and, a, and another popularity type of contest. And I can readily admit that the package that I brought certainly played a part, okay? So if I'm not big haired and guitared and over the top and, and, and very high profile, I don't know. Maybe my impact on the game of soccer in the United States would uh, would have been different. And therefore, the ease in which I was voted into the Hall of Fame might be very, very different. All right, Mossy, anything else? Uh, not on that. Do you want to move on to yeah, the let's uh, move on. Let's move CBA? On. Sure. We have a deal, Alexi. Uh, a tentative agreement. Uh, the uh, Players Association has agreed on a, a new CBA, and it will now be voted on by the players, and all they need is a simple majority, and the expectation is that it will pass, and thus uh, preseason will begin in late February and the regular season in early April. Uh, so uh, that's the end of that. I and mean, as far as the deal itself, uh, the owners did get their two-year extension, which was the main point of contention. So that fact alone is causing most people to view it as a quote-unquote win for the owners while the players quote-unquote caved. But the players did get some good things out of it. Uh, no salary cuts in 2021. There's some increases in salary and bonuses over the course of the deal. And then uh, free agency gets a little bit easier to attain in the last couple of years of the deal. So uh, what are your, your overall thoughts here? My overall thoughts are, is that as far as we have come, we still have a long way to go. And that this is representative of the reality of where MLS is and where the MLS players are. Uh, in that, you know, we, we talk about the millionaires and there are 
players that are making millions, but the reality is that many players, uh, they can't afford not to be paid. Uh, they can't afford to necessarily even take pay cuts. And, you know, when, <laughs> did they cave? I don't think they, I don't necessarily think they cave. They still got some concessions, but I think it's relative to the position that they are in, the moment that we're in as a world, uh, and the reality of the business when it comes to major, to major league soccer. Now, it was interesting to me <clears throat> to hear the, um, hear the way that it was framed when in the midst of these negotiations, we find out that someone like uh, Cincinnati was spending uh, millions and millions of dollars to buy a player. And, and a lot of people were bent out of shape about that and pointed to the optics of it. And, and my point was, uh, just because you are losing money doesn't mean that you don't have money. Just because you are losing money doesn't necessarily mean that you're not going to spend money. And in this case, it was strange because this is something that we have been screaming and yelling at the owners to do since MLS started. Spend money, spend money, spend more money. Now that it's happening at a time when they are talking about the money that they have lost relative to this negoci the negotiation, that's where a lot of people pointed to the bad optics. But owners don't care. They don't care about the optics of it. Okay, The, the owners recognize that they are going to be painted as villains automatically because that is the traditional type of portrayal and they will not gladly but they will accept the fact that no matter what they do they are going to be painted uh painted as villains but the business goes on and especially if you are players and and, and saying well you're telling us that you are losing money and yet you're going out and spending millions and millions of dollars yes because you have the money and by the way, you're spending it on players. This is money going to players, players that are going to be part of your MLSPA. Now, that necessar doesn't necessarily help the players that are part of it right now. But ultimately, if your quest is to help MLS players, by the way, it's not a mandate to help just domestic players, just American players. It's to help MLS players. Then you should be excited and championing uh, owners and a league that spends more and more money uh, on the players. So that that was interesting, an interesting phenomenon that I that I saw uh, I saw occur. And as I said before, the league they didn't they didn't care ultimately how it looked when it came to the optics. They ultimately cared about making sure that come that 2026 World Cup, they weren't uh, faced with a situation where they had to renegotiate. And ultimately, they got this because this is going to go through the 20, uh, 27 season, and so they won't have to face a work stoppage. They won't have to face a moment when the leverage is for the players for this. And this is still all theoretical. This moment when all of this money is going to suddenly appear when it comes to soccer because of the, uh, the stars aligning in 2026 in the uh, joint uh, world world cup. And this money that this pot of money that people believe is going to be there. I'm not saying it's not going to be there, but this is what it was guarding against. Uh, this is why this whole, CBA negotiation took on the tone that it did. Yeah, I saw you and Brian Dunseth butting heads on Twitter over this whole issue. That was that was fun to see. Um, I, I do want to address the big signing you alluded to that Cincinnati FC made late last week. Um, I want to flash back to about 12 months ago, January of 2020, when Matt Doyle was banging the drum for an MLS team to sign Gabby Goal, who you might recall at the time was the biggest star in South American club football coming off a 2019 in which he was the top scorer in the Libertadores scored two in the final against river was crowned South American player of the year. His loan uh, uh, from Inter Milan to Flamengo was coming to an end. So there was a question, is he going to sign permanently with Flamengo or go back to Europe? And in the midst of all that, Matt Doyle said, Hey, why doesn't LAFC sign him? And Matt Doyle was derided on Twitter for suggesting that people said, you're delusional. A guy like Gabby goal is never going to sign an MLS. And I said at the time, it only feels far-fetched because he's Brazilian. There are Argentinian and Uruguayan players of comparative pedigree to Gabigol that are now signing with MLS and view it as a viable option. But Brazil is 
well behind the rest of South America in terms of MLS acceptance. It's the one market that MLS hasn't really cracked, the one frontier they haven't conquered. Well, there was a significant development on that front late last week. Uh, Cincinnati FC completing the signing reportedly for 18 million euros of this 21-year-old Brazilian striker, Brené da Silva from Sao Paulo. Uh, This kid is a legit talent. He was one of the breakout stars in South American, in, in Brazilian football last year. Um, and was being linked to some pretty big European clubs, the likes of Ajax, Arsenal, Atalanta, and instead he goes to Cincinnati FC. So it's being rightly hailed uh, as a landmark deal uh, in MLS because it's the first Brazilian player of this with this profile to come to MLS. So MLS may have just cracked the last remaining market in South America that you know was, was sort of holding out. And 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 listen, I have some questions about whether this move for this player specifically to go to a team like Cincinnati FC is the right move for his career. But just in general, the bewilderment in the Brazilian media that a player at that part stage of his career would come to MLS, it's just revealing of how much they've had their head in the sand the last few years and don't realize, realize that this is the direction that MLS has been going down. And that, like I said, countries like Argentina and Uruguay and Colombia have bought into it. So why not Brazil? So it was kind of funny to see the, the reaction in the Brazilian media. But here we are, a very talented 21-year-old Brazilian striker coming to MLS. Well, listen, Masa, you've been telling me for years that it's every young Brazilian boy's dream to come to Cincinnati. <laughs> All right. Uh, this is great. No, this is wonderful. And, and by the way, this this speaks to the opportunity that exists. Um, and, you know, maybe it's the opportunity that was not maybe I, I, I tend to believe that it is the opportunity that was created by the world in which we live in and, and the pandemic in that there are. There are changes in attitude that are often and and perception um, and therefore credibility that is being driven by uh, a lot of the the business and the finances. And there are, quote unquote, deals out there. So I wonder, you know, some of the stuff that's happening, whether it's MLS buying players, like you mentioned, or even MLS selling players, I wonder what those deals would be in a, quote unquote, normal time or even if those deals would be there. And so, uh, so you have to, you know, <laughs> what, what do we say? Make, uh, make lemonade out of lemons. And maybe MLS is, is recognizing that despite losing money, MLS ownership and as a league still has money. And this is much smarter, smarter money being spent right now and money that is going to go a lot farther than in normal times. And if and when we return to some sort of semblance of normalcy, MLS will have used this moment as that opportunity to position itself going forward in a much better position and to have done some deals that maybe a few years from now, we look back and say, man, that was that was seeing around the corner. And that was a really smart recognition of time and place and uh, has really benefited, not just in the player that you signed, but in opening up hearts and minds and ultimately opening up those pathways that you talked about, uh, whether it's Brazil or anybody else. Some of them have already been open, but maybe they open up even uh, even more. So this is, you know, this is this is a fun type of situation to be in right now, but a very, very different type of situation. We talk about all the deals, the loan deals that are going on, the players that are being sold, the the prices that are involved when it comes to domestic talent, but also the incoming talent and some of the prices associated that maybe even would be more in normal times. So this is, it's a strange way to say it, but this is almost a, the salad days or a, or, or a really, Uh, positive type of moment in a negative type of environment for Major League Soccer. And maybe they're just turning it into that. I don't know. Do you you think that this is relative to the the times that we're living in? No, I mean, I I think this is the direction the league is going in and it's exciting times. Yeah. This, this, uh, CBA dispute was a little bit of a buzzkill, but I think the the general trajectory of this league is, is up and signing younger and younger players from, from, like I said, all these other South American countries. And so, no, I, I think this is a sign of the times. Yeah. All right. Well, listen, once all these players ultimately are here and playing, whatever the teams look like, uh, we, we know that the CONCACAF Champions League is something that um, 
is is growing and evolving. Uh, if you uh, if you subscribe to this podcast, you will all you will have recognized this week that there was a special bonus uh, podcast about a fifteen minute little uh, episode of myself interviewing the uh, president of Concacaf, Victor Montaliani. And the reason why we did that, if you didn't listen to it, is because news came out this past week that there is a completely revamped CONCACAF Champions League coming in a few years from now. Uh, Not only revamped, but completely expanded to the tune of 50 different teams that will be participating in group stage play when it comes to CONCACAF Champions League. Uh, This was out of the blue to a certain extent. Uh, but this was and, and, and is designed to raise all of CONCACAF as a whole and all of the individual t- teams. While we talk about the United States and Mexico and, uh, and Canada and kind of the big teams when it comes to CONCACAF, Victor Montaliani or CONCACAF in general is, resp- is responsible for the welfare uh, and the improvement of all of them. And he believes that this type of format is going to help continue continue on and it's going to increase the number of games uh travel is still going to be there although there's some regional aspects of it i'm not going to get too much into the weeds you can listen to it right now but i think in general that this is Concacaf saying the interaction between clubs uh and between leagues is going to become more and more important and maybe on the horizon we've talked about it before Maybe there is this ultimate league that features MLS uh, combining with uh, League MX or something like that. All of this is being talked about and envisioned right now, and everybody's trying to kind of capitalize on it. But but the more intra-CONCACAF type of play that happens, from a CONCACAF perspective, they feel that it benefits benefits everybody. We're going to talk a little bit more about... uh, Tigris uh, in a little bit and what they are doing. But you know, ultimately, this is about trying to be champions of CONCACAF and trying to make that tournament something bigger and better for the individual teams, but ultimately for the viewing public out there. I, I think, I'm not sure, but I think that this does it. Um, we will see. Like I said, they got a big runway here for a couple of years where nothing is going to change, but it's going to look very, very different in a couple of years when those 50 teams start out in group stage play. And there's three different groups. There's North America, there is Central America, and then there's the Caribbean. And you play in group stage, and in essence, then teams come out of it. So in a strange way, the round of 16 when you come out of group play could be easier than your actual group play in terms of the opponent that you face. But you'd have to, you know, you have to take it uh, as a way to bring everybody forward. I don't know. What did you think about the CONCACAF Champions League news, Masi? Well, first off, this interview you conducted this past week was done under the State of the Union umbrella, and yet I was not notified. Uh, So uh, Ryan Karutz will be hearing from my lawyers very soon. (laughs) Rest assured of that. Um, uh, But no, I... I like it. I mean, look, when you, when you, the devil's in the details, of course, and when you look into it, you can have disagreements about how many spots are allocated to this league or that league. Uh, and we'll have to see how this all plays out when it fires up in the fall of 2023. But as a general idea, I know a lot of people find the group stage uh, tedious and think we're just going to end up in the same place that we are now with uh, MLS teams and Liga MX teams contesting all the climactic matches. But I kind of think the, the setup they have now is awkwardly abrupt for what's ostensibly the marquee club competition of the region. Uh, and adding a group stage in the fall creates more of a sense of a journey. And it's a more substantive part of your, of your soccer calendar over the course of the year versus it just being this quick sort of knockout competition. So generally speaking, I like it. I, I like sort of adding some meat to this competition. I think it also is reflective of the fact that there there are supporters out there and teams and supporters of teams that that want to see what they what they perceive as growth and the ability to be in Concacaf Champions League is it's important that you get to puff out your chest because you are competing in something that is elite and now more teams are going to be given that that opportunity and well. MLS success is, is, is wonderful. We are also schooled to recognize that big teams and great teams are competing on multiple fronts and have aspirations both in terms of their domestic league performance coupled with being champions of 
something that's greater than just their league. And so I think this, this does that, and this gives more teams that, uh, that opportunity going forward. So I think it's going to be a good thing. Um, like you said, some of the details are still yet to be uh, figured out. Uh, very quickly, coming up this week is the draw for the 2021 CCL, which is still under the, I guess we'll call it old format of just going right into the round of 16. Uh, and so looking forward to that, the four MLS teams in it are uh, Columbus uh, having one MLS Cup, uh, Philadelphia Union is the Supporter Shield winners, Portland, which won the MLS's back tournament, and Atlanta, who get in as the U.S. Open Cup representative because they won it in 2019 and there was no U.S. Open Cup in 2020, so they get that slot. And you likely will also have Toronto FC, provided they get past Forge FC, this Canadian battle there. And then uh, the four Liga MX teams in it uh, are Monterey, America, Cruz Azul, and Leon. Interesting to note, Leon is in pot two. All the other MLS and Liga MX teams I mentioned are in pot one. So, uh, so somebody in that pot one is going to have to face Leon uh, in that round of 16, which is not going to be easy. So uh, you can look forward to that this week and see what, what matchups it spits out. Awesome. Awesome. All right. Anything else, Mossy? That's it. All right, we're going to take a real quick break. When we come back, we will uh, take a trip around the rest of the world. Don't go away. All right, welcome back. Uh, Plenty of stuff happening around the rest of the world. We're going to take a little jaunt, if you will, and uh, see what was going on. What do you want to talk about first, Masi? Uh, Why don't we start in England? There was a massive game at Anfield this past week. You don't say. You don't say. Who was that? Who was involved in that one? Uh, Manchester City took care of Liverpool, uh, four to one, uh, with uh, a lot of help from Brazilian goalkeeper Allison. <laughs> Just a nightmarish second half, uh, gifted City two goals. But nevertheless, I thought City was the better team. Uh, they are on a roll. Uh, it's been trending in this direction. Uh, they've kind of had this feel of the team that's going to take charge of this title race in England. The Kevin De Bruyne injury gave me some pause. I thought maybe that might slow their momentum, but it hasn't. They haven't missed a beat without him. And so now they're five points clear of second place United with a game in hand. They win that game in hand, it'd be eight. And we're past the midway point of the season. So it's really hard to see at this point, somebody other than Manchester City winning the Premier League crown, which is great for Pep after, you know, finishing a distant second to Klopp and Liverpool last season, regaining that title this season would be a, a nice feather in this cap. Um, Klopp very testy afterwards. Uh, you know, I, I, I've said before in this podcast, I kind of miss the happy go lucky Jurgen Klopp. Now, every question you ask him, you get this Jose Mourinho esque uh, response. Uh, but yeah, I, I have a lot of thoughts on this game, but I'll let you go first. What were your overall thoughts? All right, well, first off, about Allison. Okay. Um, <laughs> you know, I, I was watching it, and all I could think about was Tin Cup, the movie Tin Cup. Uh, and, and in a good way, because I think it, it's so perfectly illustrated how most of the time when we talk about style of play, philosophy, identity, culture, all that kind of stuff, it's all BS, okay? This was the ultimate illustration of saying, this is the hill I'm going to die on and going right back to the well, even when it wasn't working, okay? And everybody else is screaming, kick the ball long. Well, if it is... If it's truly what you want to do and you, you're, you're, you're not just a, a team that's going to kick the ball long, then that's what you have to do. And you have to be willing to recognize that even at the worst moment, it could go wrong. But if you truly believe that's the best way to play, then that's what you should, uh, that's what you uh, should do. Now, it was <laughs> obviously, as you mentioned, uh, you know, ultimately led to them, uh, led to them losing. I don't think is is he going to lose sleep about it? Yeah, I think he'll be kicking himself. But if if the solution is don't try to play like that anymore after you've been taught that this is how you are to play, then it's a betrayal. And I don't, I don't want that. And so I kind of love the fact that it was this beautiful, romantic, just complete destruction. <laughs> <laughs> and and that it led to their loss, I think, says a lot about who he is as a player and, and much more about the team. Now, Klopp, I'm going to get to in a second. So first off, let, let's let's uh, let's talk about the, talk about that. Your thoughts on that. Oh, yeah, I, I agree. Uh, I'm generally supportive of this whole play out of the back um, fad, if you want to call it that. Well, uh, I do think, now. OK, all right. You know, I, I do think 
sometimes common sense has to usurp philosophy. And there are instances where a goalkeeper has the ball and two strikers are bearing down on him and there's nobody available for a pass. And at that point you have to hoof it up the field. You can't be that stubborn to, uh, but uh, yeah, I mean, it was, it was amazing to see because Allison is such a great goalkeeper and so good with his feet, but it just shows you that anybody can have a, a, just an awful day. I mean, it happens to even the best of them. All right. So let's talk a little bit about Klopp here and then we'll go back onto the field. So I love Klopp. Um, but I, I may be coming to the realization that, that I love a winning Klopp in that if, and here's, here's another thing. If, if Klopp is only Klopp when things are going well and the team is winning, then he's really not Klopp because Klopp has built himself and built his image and his brand on being the, the anti Mourinho, right? I mean, this is stuff we expect from, from Jose Mourinho, right? When Klopp does it, you kind of look away and it gives you that a, a, a yucky feeling that, wait, this, this guy that was kind of happy-go-lucky, not, doesn't mean you're not intense, doesn't mean you're not competitive and want to win, but saw life and saw the game in a very different way is really at his core just this this guy that when things don't go right is going to blame others uh, or take it out on the press or be bitter uh, about it or, you know, or, or act like a child <laughs> at times, man, that I, I, I don't, I still ha- hold out hope that that's not. And that was just one of those things. I'm like, you're allowed to have bad days, but I thought it was a, I thought it was a bad look for him. I thought it was a bad look for, um, for the league. And like I said, you don't, you don't have to be cheery after you lost or anything like that, but you do have to be Klopp. And this was as anti Klopp as I've seen in a long time. Oh, I agree. Um, he, he's been cranky for a while now. I think it just, he's just seems mentally drained by everything he's had to deal with for the past year. Uh, all the difficulties brought on by the coronavirus pandemic, which I know every manager around the world is dealing with. Um, but in a way, it kind of spoiled a little bit. Liverpool winning that league title for the first time in 30 years. And he sort of had that moment taken away from him a little bit that he had worked so hard towards for several years. Uh, and then all the injuries this season, all the bad luck, the, the negative results, and it's all just caught up with him. And, and yeah, he's just incredibly cranky in these interviews. And I agree with you. It makes me uncomfortable uh, in a way that it doesn't when it's Jose Mourinho because you expect it from him. But when it's Klopp, you just kind of grimace when he goes after these poor reporters unfairly a lot of the time, I think, recently. So it, it's, it's tough to watch. But, but ultimately, the, the question that, 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 uh, that he went off on was ultimately about kind of accepting the fact that they're not going to win the league. And basically it's just about top four here, which is a completely understandable and, and logical type of question to ask a Jurgen Klopp and a Liverpool team in this moment with where, uh, with where they are. The answer is yes, though, ultimately, this is what Liverpool is right now. And, and I think I said last week, they were so good and they finally got to the, the top of the mountain that they can certainly be forgiven, especially with the injuries and what's, uh, what's gone on for not being as, as great as they, uh, as they were right now. But I mean, is it, is it over Mossy? Is, yeah. Is it uh, over? Liverpool are, are out of it as far as the title and they are just in the top four race now. Yeah. United is the only team that even has a puncher's chance of keeping up with city, just looking at the table the way it is right now. And, and even them, like I said, if city wins that game in hand, then it's eight points. Uh, even then United seems completely far-fetched. I do want to talk about Phil Foden uh, mm-hmm. because um, it's interesting the way this whole debate has turned. Um, Phil Foden and Jaden Sancho uh, were both members of the Manchester city uh, Academy And neither one had an immediate path to playing time with the senior team. And so Jadon Sancho decided to leave and go to Dortmund, where he got on the field right away, blossomed into this big star to the point where if we hadn't had a pandemic this past 
uh, summer window, he probably would have gone for 100 million euros. Well, Phil Foden chose to stick it out. And for two or three years there, his playing time was very sporadic. Whenever he got on the field, he looked amazing to me, which is what made it so frustrating that he wasn't playing more because I felt like he was ready for a bigger role, but Pep obviously felt otherwise. And so that led to a lot of people, including myself, suggesting, hey, maybe he should go the Jaden Sancho route and go somewhere where he can play. And there were others like uh, Arlo White who bristled at that and said, uh, no, he's at the perfect place. He doesn't need to be playing to develop just by training every day on a team like Manchester City, getting to learn from Pep, getting to learn from players like David Silva and Kevin De Bruyne. He's going to get better. And then when he's ready, Pep will play him. And so that was sort of a running debate there for a year or two. I even did a Mossy Makes the Case about it, where I explored this whole concept of, you know, and I said it's different and there's no definite right or wrong. Uh, each situation is different. But generally speaking, I felt like for young players, it's better to actually get on the field and work out the kinks right. in games rather than you know, I, I didn't totally buy into this notion that just by watching other players play, you're going to learn. And um, uh, well, lo and behold, uh, the worm has turned here late last season. Phil Foden did start to get on the field regularly and was great. And it's carried over into this season. And he was absolutely phenomenal this past weekend. Best player on the field by a mile involved in all four city goals. And so late in the game, I knew this was coming. Arlo White very smugly said, to think there were people that suggested that Phil Foden should have gone elsewhere. Come on, this was the perfect place for him to develop, learning from David Silva, Kevin De Bruyne, et cetera. Uh, and so the Arlo Whites of the world are now claiming total victory in this debate. And I, I, I can't argue with it. I mean, Keith Costigan was on my side and I saw him tweeting uh, in the last couple of days like, yeah, I guess I was wrong about this Phil Foden thing. So uh, well, what do you make of it? Well, neither of you are necessarily wrong. Let Arlo have his moment, okay? Arlo and company, let them have their moment. It's fine. Um, you're not necessarily wrong. Is is he coming good now because of because of what? I mean, he he's grown, he's learned, he's changed. By the way, if he had gone someplace else, there's nothing to say that he wouldn't be playing and playing well and, and doing good things. So that's, I mean... Far be it for me to defend you, Mossy, on anything, but <laughs> <laughs> but I can understand. Yeah, and this isn't. I I don't necessarily think that you were wrong, unless unless you didn't ever think that he was going to get a chance. And maybe you know, maybe maybe the the way things were going, it didn't. It looked bleak. But now that he's that he's doing good things, and he is doing good things. He's wonderful to watch. I mean, his his value right now. Who knows what it. It possibly is on the uh, on the current and open market out there when it comes to a young a player like that, and it's fun. He's fun to watch. He's he's in the same way that we talked about Jaden Sancho. We we can talk about him in the same way in that there's that moment of something magical could happen when he gets on the ball. And the other day, plenty of magical things happen. Uh, yeah, uh, who, who missed the uh, penalty? Gundogan. Uh, Gundogan. Gundogan. Yes. So. Um, it's important, I think, for all players, but in particular goal scorers, they talk about having a very short memory and, and forgetting. And the fact that he was able to put that away, which even at the moment thought, oh, the game's changed now. This was it. And you saw the reaction from the bench and Pep and, and all that. And you, you miss penalties. It happens. Now, Man City <laughs> is in a situation where even Pep is talking about seriously considering uh, – Ederson is his PK, PK taker. So they're going to have to sort that out. But his ability uh, to forget that and to go on and still play a part, that's mental fortitude. That is, a, that is a skill just like trapping the ball and a valuable one to be able to not let one mistake become another mistake or not let one mistake uh, hinder what's going on uh, in the future. And especially for goal scorers, that, that ability – to not harp on something like that is is incredibly precious and valuable to have. So, and and they got plenty of players that are like that. And uh, we talked about Klopp shifting gears to another uh, uh, former Dortmund German manager, Thomas Tuchel, off to a pretty good start at Chelsea. They beat Sheffield United two one this past weekend. Uh, interesting, Pulisic was left out of the match day squad altogether, which set off alarm bells on Twitter and a lot of people speculating if it's down to his recent form and maybe. Him and Tuchel don't have the greatest relationship. Uh, and then Tuchel came afterwards and somewhat vaguely said that Pulisic is dealing with some personal family issue of some sort. Uh, who knows what that is. So who the heck knows what that's about. But yeah, I mean, Tuchel, I, I kind of said this a couple weeks ago and I'll reiterate, he, he's very much a tactician, a bit of a mad scientist. And so I think a team like Chelsea is more his speed rather than PSG where he did have 
uh, stars like Neymar and Mbappe who are going to condition how you play a little bit more. You know, you, there's only so much you can ask those guys to press. And, you know, you're not going to have a good pressing team when you have Neymar and Mbappe up there as two of your attacking players. So things like that. So I kind of get the sense that he's been liberated somewhat in getting to manage Chelsea. And he seems to be really enjoying it so far. Now it's early. And, you know, with Chelsea, things can go from good to bad in a hurry. A couple of bad results and he's on the hot seat. So, uh, but so far, so good for Thomas Tuchel at, at Chelsea. I mean, but you bring up a good point in that some managers, coaches are, are better suited for players that have kind of yet to evolve or, or players that aren't bigger than their coach or in some cases, I guess, their their club. And that is a specific skill set, too, is to be able to manage big egos and big personalities when it comes to something like that. The problem for Tuchel or anybody else is if they if you're successful then you create monsters, little monsters, <laughs> in, in that they then get bigger and that therefore you have to, if you want to maintain that type of environment, you have to move them on and constantly be replacing them with people that aren't bigger than you or don't have larger than life personalities or, or large egos. Um, but he does seem to be comfortable and enjoying at least the initial honeymoon period has been good in terms of points and uh, and the way they're playing and and hopefully uh, hopefully everything's okay with uh, with Christian from a personal perspective and uh, and that we see him back on the field going forward or who knows maybe he's not part of their plans in which case he'll have to find someplace else I mean it's happened before uh, to players that it's just not the coach's cup of tea and who knows uh, that could possibly who knows he could possibly be on the move this summer and then last match in England before we shift gears to Zlatan uh, was incredible match at Old Trafford uh, United and Everton 3-3 draw terrible result for United who led 2-0 and 3-2 and they give up an equalizer in the last kick of the game uh, De Gea definitely at fault on the first Everton goal and some people thought on the last one as well so there's some talk that he might get dropped but yeah it, look if you're United and you have any aspirations of of catching up to Manchester city. This is the sort of game you can't be dropping points. Uh, and so, uh, so I, I get confused now is Ole Gunnar Solskjaer good or bad? Because <laughs> <laughs> I can't keep track of this Mossy. I need a definitive type of answer. Here. Yeah, it, yeah, it wasn't good. It wasn't, uh, it wasn't good. It wasn't good goalkeeping. Um, and it wasn't good if you're a Manchester uh, United fan, especially in terms of this, this race that you got going on. All right. Should we go over to Italy? Yep. Oh, the man, the myth, the legend, the god, the lion, whatever you want to call him, Zlatan just continues on. It's, uh, it's, it's just wonderful to see. He scored his 500th club goal. Now, it, and this is, gets into a big question, the, the tally and the numbers when it comes to some of these players, when it comes to total goals, it's a little more secure and verified nowadays, but you know, we've had this conversation when it comes to Pele and we've had the conversation when it comes to Romario and uh, I'm sure there will be others as what you do count and what you don't count. But this is legit in that this is his 500th club goal. We can probably see every single one of them if you wanted uh, out there on uh, on YouTube. But it, it it's an evergreen question, but it's always worth asking. What makes him so good at this age? I mean, uh, he is a freak of of nature when it comes to what he is able to do. Now, look, I know it was against Crotone and they won four nothing, but I think it was a perfect example of why he is so good. If you saw, the, he's not a one trick pony, okay? He's not a one trick lion, I guess you would say. He is able to, we know use his size and his strength and dominate when it comes to the air and get on those crosses. We've seen him time and time. But even in the game the other day, give and go. Uh, so his his ability to even be a playmaker is oftentimes undervalued or underappreciated. And then on the doorstep, he scored a goal on the doorstep too. So I, I just think that his bag of tricks has always been wide and, and incredibly good. And that hasn't changed, even though he has, as he's gotten older, obviously had to change a little bit. He still just brings so many different weapons uh, when it comes to his arsenal that can that can kill you. And he's so good at all of them. And and he scored two. It was goals 500 and 501 in his club career. And I was looking into breakdown of how many he scored for each club. And remember, 53 of those are with the LA Galaxy. And I, I was trying to think, does he have a club that you associate him with more than 
then other ones are no. He's just not had that sort of career. He's bounced around so much that, I mean, when you close your eyes and think of Zlatan, is there a specific jersey that that pops in your brain more than the other one? I, I'm not sure. Huh? There's nothing. I don't think that there's an iconic type of jersey look or even picture or even moment, I guess. Uh, I mean, you know, from an MLS perspective, we talk about the goal that, that, that he scored, but he has been this, it's not a vagabond because it's uh, it's of his of his making and uh, and his choice to be that and to constantly move. It's not as if he's been kicked out of places. He's looked to other and at times what he feels are are greener pastures and even some unique pastures. And that's you know, and and I think there is a recognition on his part that he wants to use the game to see the world and get as many experiences as possible. In the same way that uh, Jurgen Klinsmann often did that and talked about that specifically, that that was a strategy and the way that he went about it. And there, there's an element of being a mercenary, but I don't, I don't look at him like that. I just look at him as saying, I'm, I'm going to check out a new experience. But it does mean that there is not that direct association with any one team. The only thing we directly associate him with is scoring goals. And he does it better than pretty much most of the, uh, uh, of humankind. Yeah, I think if I had to pick, it would be either PSG or AC Milan. Those are the two clubs I associate him with a little bit more than the other ones. But you're right, there's not really. Um, but yeah, he scored uh, He scored two. Uh, Rebic got two as well. So Milan thumped Crotone. Uh, Inter uh, took care of Fiorentina 2-0. And Juve beat Roma 2-0. Cristiano Ronaldo with a goal there. So uh, tremendous uh, three-team race in Serie A. Milan in first place. Inter two points back. And Juventus seven points back at Milan, but with a game in hand. So, you know, it is, I was kind of thinking about this in the last couple of days in this uh, wacky topsy turvy pandemic season in which we have Juventus in third place in Syria, PSG in third place in Liga. You have uh, Barcelona and Real Madrid, both 10 points back of Atletico Madrid. Uh, even in the Premier League, you've had nine different clubs occupy the top spot. The one league that's impervious to all that is the Bundesliga where it's business as usual uh Bayern Munich churning out the results and comfortably in first place running away with it um which you know there, there's a conversation to be had there on a different day about uh, that how problematic that is in my opinion um but uh but no so that's where we are in terms of uh all right well you mentioned <laughs> Bayern Munich so let's let's just finish it up here before we move on with uh the, the Tigres and Palmeiras uh semi-final and uh, what's the score right now? I know you're watching it as we speak. Uh, uh, early second half, Bayern Munich leading Alali 1-0 on a goal by Robert Lewandowski. Okay, what a surprise there. Boy, just print it. Um, so we, we know this, this final is coming, and we know from one perspective uh, that, that Tigres is going to be one of the teams. Congratulations to Tigres. It, it's wonderful for, obviously, the club, uh, but for Liga MX and directly or indirectly for all of us in CONCACAF. For the first time ever, we have a CONCACAF team in the final of the Club World Cup, and absolutely deserving. Uh, they, looked, they looked really, really good. They, they weathered the storm a little bit in the, in the second half, as you can imagine, because they were up uh, one nothing with, uh, uh, with Gignac uh, having scored the, uh, um, the penalty. And they just held on to that, uh, that goal lead and uh, made their way into the final. And it's just, it, it, it's good to see. It wasn't, it wasn't smash and grab. It wasn't parking the bus uh, well-deserved in and individual performances and collectively as a team. Uh, they were impressive, really impressive. Uh, no, I agree. Listen, I've uh, ranted enough on this podcast last few weeks about uh, the way Brazilian club, clubs play. So I don't want to go down that path. Um, except to say, I tweeted this right after the game. I'll repeat it here. There's no shame in losing to Tigres, but th there is real shame in a Brazilian club in a game like that being so reactive, so reliant on long balls, unable to string passes together. Um, I mean, there was a stretch from the middle of the first half uh, to the middle of the second half of the game where Palmeiras hardly got a touch of the ball, where Tigres toyed with them. Uh, and I thought they were the far superior team. Uh, Weverton, the Palmeiras goalkeeper, stood in his head, made some incredible yes. saves. <laughs> we talked about Allison and Ederson earlier. Weverton might be the best Brazilian goalkeeper oh. right now. And without him, that, that could have been like a blowout for Tigres. So that was well-deserved and, and, and very disappointing performance by Palmeiras. And yeah, you know, it's funny. We talk so much on this podcast about... Uh, this quest by MLS clubs to uh, get over the hump 
in uh, uh, CCL and top hole uh, Mexican teams. Uh, Mexican teams have had a similar bugaboo at the Club World Cup. Uh, they had never gotten to the final. Now, more often than not, they've been placed on the same side of the bracket as the European team. Uh, had they always been on the same side of the bracket as the South American team, I suspect by now Mexican team would have reached the final. But nevertheless, it hadn't happened before. The Club World Cup final had become two Mexican teams uh, what the World Cup quarterfinal is to the Mexican national team, that mythical fifth game, you know, that. Uh, and so I'm glad it was Tigres that finally broke through because they have been the best Mexican club of the last decade, uh, led by a player in Andre Pierre Gignac, who is just a fascinating story. I mean, you talk about, uh, you know, the path. Uh, What's that expression? The path uh, not followed or <laughs> um, and, and, you know, path it's just travel. Yes. Yeah. I mean, and, and so, you know, here's a guy that that in 2015 was playing for Olympique Marseille, uh, getting called up, you know, fairly regularly for the French national team. He played in the 2010 World Cup uh, in South Africa and uh, decides at the age of 29 to pick up and move to Mexico. And I mentioned how bewildered the Brazilian media was that this kid Brenner has gone to Cincinnati FC. The French media was stupefied at the time that Gignac would go to Mexico, uh, but that's the path he chose. He spent the last six years there. Uh, he is an absolute god in Mexican football. He's approaching 150 goals for Tigres. Uh, he's their all-time leading scorer. And he did get to play in Euro 2016 uh, even after he had moved to Tigres, uh, actually almost scored in the final against Portugal, hit the post late. Uh, but then since then has faded from the French national team. So I suppose that would be the one trade off in the decision that he made. But nevertheless, it, it's I think about that often in comparison with somebody like Olivier Giroud, who did get to play in the World Cup and win it. So overall, if you look at their careers, advantage Giroud. But just from a club standpoint, Olivier Giroud has spent the last three or four years, yes, playing for big European clubs, but kind of in and out of the lineup, spending a lot of time on the bench, seeming frustrated. Uh, while Gignac goes to Mexico and gets to be a god. And you sort of wonder, which, which path would you rather have? It's kind of a fascinating question. Huh? Well, if you take the road less traveled, you have to be willing to accept that people aren't going to necessarily follow you uh, or know and or care about where you have been. And we talk about this all the time in terms of the perception uh, and how that perception matters. And so that he is a god for a team in a country and in a league that, from a French perspective, is, I'm sure, whether they will say it or not, looked down upon, is a choice that he made. There's nothing he can necessarily do to change that. And there's also nothing that, that's why I say it, does it matter where you play? Yes, it matters in terms of the perception, but ultimately, you know, he could he could have led the line for France. I have no no, no doubt that he could have done that. I, I hope he didn't because the powers that be that are making the decisions felt that he just wasn't good enough and that where he played didn't ultimately make that decision. So because I think yes there are big leagues and yes, there are leagues that, uh, that, that often and rightfully attract us and, and bring our attention, but it, but it doesn't mean that there aren't great players and that there aren't really, really quality leagues that you just might not follow or know about. And just because you don't follow or know about something doesn't mean that it's not, not just good, but it's also that it's, that it, that it's not comparable or could even be in a strange way, dare I say it even better. And so you got to be really, I think, open, especially when you are a, a national team coach to recognize that your job is to get the best collection of players, not just the best players relative to where uh, their, uh, their resumes uh, show that they play. Uh, Luis Aguilar with a, a snarky message. He says, uh, Gignac would have scored more goals than Giroud at the 2018 World Cup. You'll recall Giroud didn't score any uh, for France in that tournament, despite them lifting the trophy. But yeah, Gignac, I saw uh, today, is the first player ever to score in the UEFA Champions League, Europa League, Copa Libertadores, CONCACAF Champions League, and Club World Cup. Awesome. That is quite the distinction. Uh, when you watch him, what what impresses me, obviously, he scores the goals and his you know his ability at creating chances. But there was a time there, especially in the second half, where his his defensive choices that he took 
were, were wonderful. That, those are endearing to other players. If you're just a goal scorer, fine, you'll, you'll be accepted because you put the ball in the back of the net. But if you're a goal scorer and you contribute from a defensive perspective, I mean, he was, he was coming back and picking off passes and making it difficult, even when they were under pressure, making it difficult for the team and even springing some counters because of his really smart way that he was able to pick off some stuff. That, like I said, that endears you to your teammates if you are a goal scorer. And not, not all goal scorers do that. And we just, we, you know, we finished talking about Zlatan, for example, that's not something that he is going to do. And so you recognize that, all right, we're going to do that dirty work because we know you're going to put the ball on the back of the net. If you have a person that says, not only am I going to put the ball on the net, but I'm going to recognize that I have a responsibility to help you defend. Oh my goodness. Uh, you will have the other 10 players that will run through a wall for you if you are adding that element. And that that's what's I think makes him one of the great players in the world. All right, Mossy, uh, anything else uh, before we go? And, and, and I know you're watching it live. So uh, yeah, we're, we're about a half hour away from a Zignac versus Lewandowski uh, showdown in the Club World Cup final. Bayern's still ahead 1-0. Uh, and that Club World Cup final, by the way, is Thursday on FS1. We'll bring that for you. I can't wait. That's going to be fun, uh, fun to see. All right, we're going to take another quick break. When we come back, oh, yes, you know what you love it or you don't. It's time for Ask Alexi. All right, we're back and it's time for uh, Ask Alexi. We uh, go out there to the social media platforms and use that hashtag Ask Alexi, ask some questions, throw some comments, either to myself, you can even ask Mossy. And we go out there and we mine those platforms for some of those questions, comments. What do the people want to know about this week? Uh, there's a fun one here about television. I'm going to save that one for last if you're okay. 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 Uh, with that. Uh, so let's start with a uh, U.S. keeper uh, wants to know, going through my list of USMNT greats to see where and what they're doing today. What are some of your favorite team members doing today? Interesting. So I, I, I did this exercise before we started recording just to kind of remind myself. And one of the things that I don't know if it's surprising, maybe it was a little surprising to me, given what American soccer is, and I guess more importantly, given what American soccer isn't, is to see how many and the overwhelming majority of players that I played with um, are still involved in the game and, and actively evolved. I mean, I'm just going to go through the, like the 94 World Cup team. If I look at it, Tony Miolo working in, uh, working in media. Uh, Mike Lapper has been on bunch of different MLS teams as a coach. Mike Burns, longtime New England uh, Revo uh, Revolution front office. Clay Coyman uh, working in uh, youth soccer. Thomas Dooley coaching, I think, over in Malaysia now. John Harks coaching. Hugo Perez coaching. Ernie Stewart, head of uh, uh, over there at the United States Soccer Federation. Tab Ramos down there coaching the coaching Houston. Uh, Eric Winall, the coaching. Kobe Jones uh, has been, uh, we've worked together on television and in the midst right now of a campaign to be uh, vice president of the United States Soccer Federation. Frank Klopas at Chicago. Uh, Mike Sorber at LAFC. Marcelo Balboa, a long time uh, uh, coach and involved in media. Brad Friedel, uh, former coach at uh, New England Revolution. Claudia Reyna headed, heading up uh, the Austin effort right now after being at uh, NYCFC and the U.S. Soccer Federation. Paul Caligiuri been involved in college soccer for years. Uh, the only people that I don't think are heavily involved are players like, like Roy Wagerly, I don't know what Roy Wigley is doing right now. I haven't talked to him in years. I know that, you know, he loved golf and kind of went down that golf path, but I don't know what he is doing right now in terms of uh, uh, making a living. Um, and then Joe Max Moore, who has been involved in soccer and done some coaching and stuff, but he was also involved in a lot of businesses and has been for a number, a number of years, but almost to a man, everybody is in some way involved. And even when you go to the 98 team, some people that weren't on the 94 team, like Eddie Pope, uh, longtime representative for the uh, for uh, players uh, players at, both as an agent and for the uh, the players union um, people like David Reggie uh, uh, coaching national teams uh, Jeff Agus uh, a VP over there at Major League Soccer so I mean you go through this there are very very few that aren't involved in soccer that's a good thing especially considering that this generation came up in kind of a wild west of American soccer. And while, I mean, just, just to be a professional soccer, a professional soccer player as an American growing up is a feat and was certainly a, a much bigger feat in and of itself. 
But then to go on and to parlay that into a livelihood and a living, um, you know, that's that's impressive. It makes me I, I, it makes me happy actually. First off, that the opportunities are there for people even after they stop kicking a ball, and second, that so many of this generation wanted to be a part of soccer. And if you look, the impact that these players have made, first you look on the field, but then you look at their continued impact off the field and what they have done. That's great. That's that's their legacy. I'm looking at, I mean, even like Brian Mazinoff, who was on the 98 team, uh, head coach of uh, Ohio State, Brian McBride, uh, working with the Federation. Uh, so, I mean, it just goes on and on and on. Precky, MLS coach, continues to be an MLS coach. So all of them are involved in soccer in one form or another, some heavily and some less so, but it's great. It's uh, it's wonderful to see. So I don't know if there's a, if there's a favorite. I just love that the, f- the fact that we are all still doing things in the game that we love. And at the time, I'll be honest with you, I, I'm not sure that we all believed that this was going to be our life just because it was so early. And as I said, it was such a weird moment where, the opportunities on the field were were there and you were very fortunate and privileged to be able to do that. And you were a very small and unique group to be able to do that. But then after, when you're not kicking the ball anymore, you looked at it as even fewer opportunities. So I'm glad that the opportunities are there. And I think it's, it's relative to the fact that the, the sport has changed and evolved. And a lot of the players that I just mentioned and the people that I just mentioned um, have done a lot to help that sport grow. Uh, next up, uh, Zach uh, wants to know, curious about your thoughts on whether or not you believe that more than two MLS-based players will be on the mainstay national team. I think that there will be uh, plenty of, not plenty, uh, not, not a majority, but a handful of domestic MLS, uh, say, Uh, based players on the national team going forward. Greg Berhalter has already said he kind of knows what his group is. I think of that group, you're going to have uh, some MLS players. I think very few of them will start. Um, And I think that there are going to be, and we were just talking about this before, there are going to be players that are given the benefit of the doubt, and some rightfully so, because of what they do and the resume that they have and the places that they are playing and the performances that they are putting out in those places where they are playing. And whether that's fair or not, that's a, that's another discussion, but I just think that's the reality of what's going to uh, happen. What I do think is going to happen though, is that when that whistle finally does blow, when your, your resume doesn't play for you, you ultimately have to do the job out there that some of the perceptions that we have are going to change. And I think that some of those MLS players, um, and you know, I've talked about this before about, you know, in a certain sense, having a chip on your shoulder and wanting to be given that respect and that credibility and not at times being given it and that driving you, I think that they are going to become important. There will be either moments or extended moments or tournaments where the perception of a player is completely changed by what that player does, both in the positive and the negative. You might have a player that has an incredible resume and is on paper supposed to be the be all and end all that stinks it up. And you might have a player that you didn't even think was going to play a part and that you downplayed or thought less of because of his MLS association that steps up and looks like a world beater. And it can happen. It can happen both ways. And so, um, yeah, but I think that going forward, just the sheer amount and the quality, let's be honest, the quality that we have, there is going to be an overwhelming majority of that final 23. We were just talking about rosters, that final 23 that is going to come from uh, players that are playing in Europe. Well, and with a fun one. uh... Vincent Marzullo wants to know, Alexi, was being on Arliss your favorite television appearance? Arliss. Oh, interesting. Arliss. Let me, let me make sure that I, uh, okay. So this, I don't know what year it was. I wish I could. 
I wish I could. That's the out. Uh, HBO program with yeah, uh, yeah, I know Robert what, Wool and, and Sports. Right. Okay. So, but I'm, I'm trying to remember what year it was. So, uh, you know, I, I, I've done different guest starring things, whether it's on HBO, like you said, with uh, this Arla show. And so basically he was an agent, a sports agent, and it was all revolved around all of the craziness that go on, that goes on in, in, in representing uh, representing athletes. And so basically they would bring in different athletes as to, to, to do cameos. He was wonderful. It was, I had so much fun doing it. Uh, Robert was such a kind and generous type of star and it was his show. And he made me feel so comfortable. The, the whole premise was there was this beautiful um, colleague that he had that I ended up stealing from him and going out with um, it aired in August, 1997. You can actually still find the, the episodes on, uh, on HBO. Yeah, that was wonderful. I had a great time doing it. it they made it incredibly easy for me. And um, I, I'm not necessarily the thespian, but I figured it out. Uh, season two, episode eight, I'm told. You know, our, our producer, Jeff Hernandez, is sending all this information. Uh, he revealed right before we started taping this podcast, he is a huge fan of the show Arliss. If Jeff wants to jump in here for a second, I was not really a big Arliss guy, but uh, but Jeff, uh, that's one of your favorite shows? All the time. It was uh, super fun as a sports fan growing up. It had all these cameos. Uh, it had like, you know, Hall of Famers. I remember Roger Clemens coming up. So they really did a good job of, mixing up that rea the reality of of being a sports agent so and you remember yeah. the alexi lalas episode unfortunately i do not <laughs> i do not remember alexi lalas episode but it, I, it I came and went know. but it's there it's there <laughs> uh, you, you can you can you can check it out I, you know so i did i did that kind of stuff i did um, oh uh, mary kate and ashley uh it was a uh, yeah uh the uh the, the twins i mean the juggernaut the billionaires as they were just cranking out movies appeared in one of their movies and that kind of stuff but yeah that was the that was probably the most fun that i had um doing something like that i auditioned for a bunch of stuff i never ended up got there was a there was a movie with uh, ben affleck called pearl harbor i remember auditioning for one of the, the the roles in that that i didn't get there was another one with val kilmer called sultan c i think it was called i auditioned for that one and didn't uh, didn't get that part so i don't know maybe I'd, I'd like to do some more. I'd like to uh, do some more uh, acting. I think in my older age, I've, I've, I've matured enough where I think I would, those auditions, I would approach them a little bit differently. Both our producers are just, they're on your IMDb page right now, just firing off uh, credits of yours. I, I didn't realize goals. you yes, had quite the- an Ashley movie is called Switching Goals. I, I, I get people all the time because <laughs> of the machine that is Mary Kate and Ashley. And especially when you have kids, uh, yeah, I was, uh, I was in that movie. So you can check me out on, on that. Yeah, that was fun. That was a, that was a good time. These are all these, you know, I talk about those, the, the opportunities and the power of what a world cup can do to an individual. It changed my life forever. And all of these different doors opened up and these different opportunities that through so they, they came through soccer. Um, but they didn't necessarily have anything to do with me me kicking a ball. We talked a little about, you know, all the different music stuff that I did. And I was heavily in, into that, but I did dabble here and there when it comes to the, uh, the Hollywood scene. So that was fun. That was a good time. Good question. Anything else, Moss? That's it. All right. We are going to take uh, one more quick little break here. And when I come back, yep, it's time for my one for the road. All right. We're back. And at the end of each pod, as we always do, I give you my one for the road. Uh, this one comes at a moment when, it's being hotly debated as to the uh, um, the all time legendary status and the greatest of all time when it comes to Tom Brady having won the Super Bowl and and all of his exploits and who who's the who's the greatest athlete ever who's the greatest uh, um, athlete ever to 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 play a game and then the definition of what an athlete is and what a sport is and we've talked about uh, all of that uh, all of that before. Um, I want to focus on on who the greatest soccer player is, Mossy. Do you have just a a, a standard answer that you that you give when people ask you? Uh, yes, as a Brazilian, if I don't say Pele, I have my citizenship revoked. So, but do you truly believe that? Uh, everybody, my father and everybody from my father's generation have ever spoken to about it is pretty convinced that he is. So I tend to go with that answer, even though obviously he's before my time. 
I'm okay. Right now, but the, the best player I've ever seen in my, is Messi in, in my time of watching the game. Okay, well, that's different. That's a different question. The best player of all time. And, and these, these questions are designed to foster debate and disagreement when it comes to this, especially when it comes to generations. So if you didn't grow up watching somebody uh, or, if you, or, if, or if that person didn't have the impact that it had. So, for example, I was a little past the Pele moment. I didn't watch him in the NASL moment. Pele came on my radar when it came uh, to soccer because of the movie Victory, honestly. I mean, that's, that's how I was introduced to him. And then I understood how important he was. And we, it was a time without YouTube or, or anything like that. But there are people that did not grow up in the time of, uh, of Pele or, um, or of Maradona. They're not, they're not gonna have the same type of impact. When I get asked this question, I always, say, Diego Maradona. Uh, And I've I've talked a little bit about how influential he was and how impactful he was, not just the way that he kicked the ball, but on on the world. And flawed, 100%, um, a uh, oftentimes a villain, yep. Uh, More sinner than saint, yep. But I still think that the way that he also transcended the game, uh, for me, I would still say that, for me, Diego Maradona is the greatest soccer player of all time in the things that he did. But I, I, to your point, Mossy, I think that there's a lot of people, I think there's more people that are going to argue Messi than are going to argue Cristiano Ronaldo. I don't, I don't necessarily know why. I'm sure there's some psychology to that as to why people feel that, that what Messi does is any more, or in this case, more than what a Cristiano Ronaldo does. And I, I, and I think it's probably because of the robotic nature and the difference in, literal difference in stature. There, there seems to be more magic involved when, when it comes to talking about someone like Messi relative to... Uh, Ronaldo, but these are the things that we do. These are the the wonderful things that we do when it comes to uh, when it comes to soccer. Uh, my answer is Diego Maradona. Your answer is Pele. Somebody listening right now is screaming that it's Messi. Somebody else is listening now and saying you're absolutely right, Alexi. It's Cristiano, and he doesn't get enough credit simply because he's got washboard abs or he's he's uh, a, a strong type of looking and he looks like a, a, a god when you see him running around on the field Go ahead. it is interesting because of the improved nutrition and fitness and all that how you're seeing in all these different sports players uh, continue to play at a super high level at an age where it was impossible in other generations so you have in all these different sports you have your tom brady's your lebron james your cristiano ronaldo's your roger federer's that you look and say my god for somebody to still be that good at that age would would, would be unthinkable in other generations so so players now are going to have sort of lengthier careers and more you know substantive list of achievements but it's going to be that I, I that strikes me as a bit unfair to past players uh so we're gonna have to figure out a way to sort of contextualize all that yeah but We've talked a lot in this pod about timing and the importance of when somebody comes on your radar and and the importance in in life and when it comes to timing and how fairness is interpreted and changed when it comes uh, to timing. So, you know, I mentioned when Diego Maradona, I I was 16 years old. It was the first World Cup that I watched. And and so that's going to have much more significance to me than something that I've seen later or something that I didn't see beforehand. And there are going to be people that came to the game through and at the moment when Messi kind of landed on the scene and the same with the, with Cristiano Ronaldo, you know, all of, all, all of this is to say is these are all, these are all good debates and these are all good problems uh, to have when it comes, when it comes to the best, but they're all subjective. I mean, we can, we can talk numbers. We talked about Zlatan's 500 goals or whatever, but it's the one, it's the one that moves you. And it's the one that makes you feel things. It's the one that is a touchstone for moments in your life 
um, that you associate with this player and this sport, even moments in your life that don't even necessarily have anything to do with that. It could be a relationship. It could be a trip, an adventure. It could be just a, a feeling that these players elicit. And that's the great thing about sports. That's the great thing about great players. You know, we saw, we saw Tom Brady and the, the debate rages on when it comes to sports of where, where he is. And we've talked about this before, but ultimately just be thankful that there are people out there that through these games and through these, these sports are able to give us these incredible moments um, that we associate with uh, moments in our life. Uh, and as I said, relationships, uh, or experiences that we have. It's all wonderful, wonderful stuff. Um, okay, Mossy, anything uh, before we go? That's it. All right, I want to appreciate, I appreciate everybody continuing to, uh, to rate and to subscribe and to download and to review and to do all the different things. Don't forget to use that hashtag, Ask Alexi out there and send us those comments, questions, and concerns. And uh, we appreciate you hanging with us each and every uh, week here on the State of the Union podcast. We will be back again next week for another edition of the State of the Union podcast. And until then, as always, size the day. You like that clip? Well, my State of the Union podcast drops every week. Subscribe now on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts.